Hello dear friends and welcome to the GeoCoast. Um, here I'm standing with Demian, um, who is a marine biologist and who used to be a colleague of mine. We used to share an office for a few years, a good few <laughs> years ago, uh, when we worked at the Coastal Marine Research Center here in Cork Harbor, which was part of UCC. Uh -huh. um, so Demian, tell us a few words about your work, like what, what, what would be the main areas of your research? Uh, well, I guess uh, Broadly speaking, I would describe myself as a, a marine biologist, a marine ecologist. Uh, my PhD was primarily looking at jellyfish around Ireland and their impact on salmon aquaculture. So obviously, uh, jellyfish have a, quite a negative impact on uh, the industry at times. And if mm. there's a high abundance, they can, uh, they can sting the salmon, um, especially, especially on the gill tissue, which is a very soft and delicate tissue. This obviously impacts the health of the fish. Um, and in the worst case scenario, when there's very high abundance, uh, they can cause um, the fish to die very, very quickly. Um, the worst case scenario was one event in 2007 up in County Antrim in a Glenarm Bay. And uh, in one particular salmon farm, every single fish was, uh, was killed when there was a, a huge bloom of Pelagia noctiluca, or what mm -hmm. some people call the purple stinger and the jellyfish were so dense in the water that they literally stopped water so the fish from... couldn't breathe. Yeah, yeah, so they suffocated essentially. Mm -hmm. Some of the fish were stung as well, but primarily it was suffocation. So there was, there was so many that they couldn't even run uh, outboard motors because mm -hmm. they would just clog up the engine, you know, the intake of the engine. But um, has this issue become only recently the focus of research, like or oh, like 20, 30 years ago, it was the same thing. We just didn't pay attention to it, maybe yeah. because there was no aquaculture. Yeah, it's a good question. Like there has been jellyfish for 600 million years. Mm. You know, they're a lot older than we are. They've been around for a long time and they're probably very successful because they're very simple animals. Well, I guess the main thing is like whether the abundance near the yeah. coast was the same or did it change in recent there's, years? There's good evidence going back um, Perhaps it's more anecdotal in nature, but there's a lot of older literature which still talks about, you know, very high abundance from time to time. But it's also clear that uh, now in uh, contemporary maritime activities, there are some regions where there are more jellyfish year on year. Whereas maybe 20 years ago, it was like every six or seven years, you mm -hmm. would see these huge blooms, these disruptive blooms. Mm -hmm. Now in some locations, it's every year. and. Um, I guess a good example is the Pelagia noctiluca that affects the salmon industry here because the same species is also uh, uh, it's endemic in the Mediterranean mm -hmm. and uh, it's disrupting their tourism because it's it's got a quite a severe sting uh, so it's affecting the tourism industry because it's shutting down beaches and if you go back uh, maybe 15 years that wasn't the case whereas now it's every year and from your point of view is a specialist in this area like what are the main reasons um, <laughs> why, why it became more abundant is it why, uh, it's do, good, do you have any answers well there are theories I, I don't think uh, we have we just don't have enough evidence to say empirically that uh, like for instance uh, one of the theories is that overfishing is uh, fishing down some of the smaller fish mm -hmm. uh, and those smaller fish are competitors with jellyfish they eat they eat a lot of them eat copepods. Okay. So, so the, basically, there's more food for jellyfish. So there's That's more why food the for jellies. Yeah. yeah. So this is one, maybe one aspect. Um, another aspect is some jellyfish species can survive uh, much better than other animals in in low oxygen environments. Mm -hmm. So where you have a lot of pollution, or in some coastal areas where you start to get uh, anoxia, uh, low oxygen, because of uh, excess nit um, nutrients, mm -hmm. uh, these jellyfish are much. They're better able to cope. And uh, these conditions are slightly favorable to them rather than some of the other species. So again, this would, uh, it gives them a competitive advantage over other animals. Mm -hmm. um, so there are two factors that um, I talked about at length in a lot of the literature, but in terms of tying jellyfish abundance to those empirically, that's difficult to do because there are very, very few long-term jellyfish monitoring programs globally, uh, never mind here in Ireland. You know, we don't really have a monitoring program in Ireland, but we monitor 
jellyfish as a bycatch. Mm -hmm. From, for instance, the Marine uh, Institute, their ground fish surveys, they would track. That's how you actually do the research. Like you go on a boat, like doing fisheries yeah. research, and you see how many yeah. jellyfish got in the nets. Isn't it? They would count it, but uh, you know those nets and those methods are designed to catch fish, not jellyfish. Mm -hmm. So it's relative abundance from one survey to the next. It's mm -hmm. not really telling us a lot about the absolute abundance. Have you done any special surveys where you go on a boat and count them? Or yeah, so we... Or maybe using aerial imagery? Uh, people have tried aerial imagery and uh, as a matter of fact that, that gigantic Pelagia bloom that uh, wiped out the salmon farm mm -hmm. in the north, that was visible using satellite uh, imagery. But those jellies were all at the surface. So once you move below the surface, it's very difficult for satellite imagery to pick up mm -hmm. those animals. And a lot of them, of course, are completely transparent. So they don't oh. reflect a particular color. So you, usually the, the phytoplankton and the chlorophyll and the water, will that's what the satellite's picking up a lot mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. And I heard theories that people linking climate change to rise, rising abundance of jellyfish. Yeah. But at the same time, I remember like a few years ago, I was sailing around the North Pole and I've seen a lot of jellyfish in very, very cold water. Yeah. So you wonder like, yeah. how can climate warming, if there is one, be yeah. linked to rising abundance? Do you believe in this? Like, what's your um, opinion? Like, it depends on the species. Uh, so some species, climate warming will favor and other species, uh, it would not be favorable for them. So you'll find that the, the ones for which, you know, warmer water is not necessarily more favorable will start to migrate north. Mm -hmm. And some species that we see now around Ireland, might, we might no longer see them around Ireland by 2030 or 2050. But we, then we'll get species migrating from uh, maybe down around Portugal or the lower latitudes will start to move up into Irish waters. Right. So the one that, for example, killed the fish farm yeah. a few years ago, it was it like 10, 20 years ago? Or? Uh, 2007. Right. So, yeah. so that particular species, is it specific to Ireland or has it migrated no. from the south? Uh, Pelagia has a very wide distribution. It's found uh, throughout the oceans between the two poles. But does it prefer cold or warm environment? Uh, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of a generalist. So, uh, so basically climate warming has nothing to do with the rising abundance of that particular species? That's a difficult question to answer. <laughs> uh, with the Pelagia, um, we think what happens is uh, the early stages of, of their life cycle are down deep. Mm -hmm. in canyons, in very deep water, like over, you know, maybe a thousand or more meters deep. And when they reach a certain size, we think they come up to the surface and then uh, various oceanic currents plus the wind will drive them uh, on shore. So, for instance, in the, Irish, in the Irish picture, you get them in the canyons off the west coast. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point in the year, and it's usually later in the year, in late summer or autumn, they come up to the surface and they get pushed into the west coast. Uh, in the Glenarm incident, there's a current that pushes up along the west coast and it, it's likely they were caught in that current and, and advected around the mm -hmm. northwest and into the northeast. Right. So basically they're more passive than fish, so actually their abundance will be linked to the intensity of near shore currents and yeah. kind of tides and waves. Absolutely, and yeah. In other words, it would be linked to the weather, to the wind, no? Absolutely, To the wind yeah. direction, yeah. So it's a, it's, it's so a mixture. So kind of blown in, like... Yeah. yeah, it's a mixture of biology and the physical environment, so... If you really want to understand the jellyfish, you have to you have to bring those two disciplines together. And in for Irish waters, for Irish coastal waters, like what are the most abundant months? Like where you see most jellyfish? Is it winter or summer? Uh, absolutely, the summertime. Um, but some of the harmful species usually occur later in the year. Mm -hmm. So there's the Pelagia noctiluca, the purple stinger that I've already mentioned. But there's another a, a very small siphonophore species that most people will not be familiar with because mm -hmm. you, you cannot see it really with the naked eye in the water. And this species usually occurs uh, from approximately mid-July on. So even though, you know, you get your, your classic uh, ocean seasonality, you get your, your spring bloom in springtime and you get all the phytoplankton growing. Mm -hmm. And then you get the, the next trophic, trophic level, your copiapods are feeding on the phytoplankton and then the jellyfish are feeding on the copiapods. But some jellyfish are also feeding on maybe small larval fish that are feeding on the copepods. Really? But it's some, some of the larger species, like your large linesbane or the barrel jelly, which can be quite big, like maybe over 35 kilograms in weight, so mm -hmm. over a half a meter in diameter. Some of those uh, species 
uh, we think they can they can survive over winter sometimes. So they usually the majority of species have uh, their life history is within one year. So they, so they move from a tiny spore or polyp to an adult mm -hmm. and spawn within one year. But and uh, what happens to them when they die? They just they dissolve. Just, yeah. Well, yeah. Or do they get eaten? hardly there's enough turtles to eat all jellyfish. No? Well, that's that's another good question actually because. Um, we're finding out now more and more that there, there are much more animals eating jellyfish than we previously thought. So Except it, Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we thought like uh, maybe sea turtles and sunfish and, and perhaps some other animals, but it's a relatively small number were feeding mm -hmm. on jellies. And uh, some, some researchers even referred to jellyfish as a, as, as a trophic dead end. That not they weren't really part of the trophic system but nothing could be further from the truth you know there's a lot of evidence that there's many fish species many commercial uh, commercially they're feeding on jellyfish they're eating jellyfish um what kind of percentage of their diet is made up from jellyfish is hard to say but there's there's very solid evidence there's lots of animals feeding on jellyfish uh -huh. You were saying that jellyfish feeds on the same food as the small fish so yeah. plankton yeah plankton yeah Many years ago, I heard some stories, and I'm just curious if they have anything to do with reality, that jellyfish, like, kind of um, cleaning the ocean from rubbish, that they <laughs> think that there's bullshit. Eh? Uh, no, I don't think that's true. There's, uh, they probably um, will pick up microplastics, you know, because they're mm. going to capture microplastics that are in those prey species already. Mm -hmm. But uh, whether those microplastics actually get... Um, consumed by the jellies and transferred into their into their tissue or intracellularly I'm not sure but the, some people are looking there's a there's a research project in the Mediterranean and they're they're looking at using jellyfish to make plastic from them mm -hmm. because they have lots of uh, proteins like uh, collagen mm -hmm. is one and they're looking at using those to manufacture plastics so they would be biodegradable plastics and uh, there's also been research looking at uh, using jellyfish tissue to absorb uh, potential pollutants and heavy metals mm -hmm. from the environment. So the jellyfish themselves may not be a solution, but some sort of innovation or technology could come from uh, the structure of their tissue and, okay. and the molecules in their tissue. So the development of this type of ideas could be one way to decrease the population. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, and um, I know that a few years ago you've been doing, I don't know, maybe you're still doing like plankton research? like using special i remember like on some occasions i helped you like when i was out with students yeah outside the harbor like you gave me like plankton nets to get the plankton in the water like yeah and then to study it under the microscope or whatever like, yeah yeah and i'm just curious like was that research completely separate or is it somehow linked to the jellyfish research that would have been linked to the jellyfish research because um obviously as as i mentioned they're they're consuming uh small zooplankton like copepods but also some other animals in the water and uh in order to study a species you you have to understand their prey as well so you wouldn't you wouldn't go out into the serengeti and study a lion without looking at what they eat and and the abundance of their prey and how many lines that whole environment can carry <clears throat> so it's the same with the jellies we need to understand how much biomass is in the ocean from the very lowest trophic levels up to the mid trophic levels for mm -hmm. where a lot of jellyfish species sort of populate that trophic food web so you need to understand both together if you want to understand the population dynamics it's it's the availability of prey and favorable physical conditions that drive those populations mm -hmm.